Well, welcome. We are going to talk today about some of our geometric controls that we have already seen in, uh, in this table of our various uh, geometric controls. But I'm going to uh, kind of go through them. Today's lecture is going to be, um, I would say, relatively shallow and relatively broad, right? We're going to get a little bit into every single one of the controls that we have with the idea that um, probably a little bit later we're going to get a little deeper into some of the ones that um, might matter to us a little bit more. Uh, as one example of that, we actually already did that a little bit with our position control, right? We kind of dug into that one a little bit deeper and saw things like um, our pattern locating tolerance zone framework and our feature relating tolerance zone framework. So we kind of went a little bit deeper with that one. Today I'm going to show you all the rest of them. And that way, when we look at different kinds of drawings, you'll be able to see the symbols and not get scared off by them, right? We'll have looked at all of them. We'll know kind of what the shape of the tolerance zones are that are implied by each one of these different uh, geometric controls. And hopefully that'll put us in better shape to be able to understand things like the drawings that we might look at and such. So um, kind of where I'm going with this is uh, that I mentioned that table just a second ago, this table right here. Uh, this table has uh, several of our geometric controls on. As a matter of fact, this is all the different symbols that you might see in a feature control frame. And I think I've already defined that and shown it to you a little bit. But a feature control frame always starts with one of these symbols over here on the left, and then it gives you all the parameters that it needs to be able to use it. And generally how that goes is uh, there's going to sometimes be this symbol that indicates that you're going to have a cylindrical uh, uh, tolerance zone, but then it's also going to give you a number, regardless of whether it's a cylindrical tolerance zone or not, it'll give you a number that tells you the size of the tolerance zone. Um, it might have some uh, modifiers such as the maximum material condition modifier. I'm going to do a whole lecture just talking about those modifiers. That's going to come up a little bit later. So just hold off on that. And then generally it references several datums. Um, in, so that's kind of the general structure of these feature control frames. Um, and so we're just basically going to kind of go down through this list and look at each one of these controls and how each one of them works and sort of what shape we can expect the uh, tolerance zone is going to be for each one of these. All right, so starting with the first one, straightness, okay? That's the name of this one right here. And you can see that um, we have here uh, kind of what that feature control frame looks like, right? It has a little straight line next to it. And then it gives you the size of that, uh, of that tolerance zone, 0 0.05. By the way, this is an important point. Um, anytime in the ASME Y14.5 standard, you see a number that is a decimal number that leads with a zero, that actually has a meaning in that standard. It means that you are in millimeters, right? Whereas if you see something where it's a decimal number and it has no leading zero, it just starts with a point and then it ends up having some numbers after it. That means you're in an inch system, right? I actually didn't know that at first whenever I was first started teaching this class and that, that was someone that called me out about that and said, hey, you're supposed to leave that zero off of there if you have uh, the inch system. And so I was like, oh, okay, thanks. I, I didn't see that at first and now I know it. But anyway, so we have a tolerance zone here of 0 0.05 millimeters and um, so this is showing you that tolerance zone and what shape it is. When you have that uh, straightness thing called out on a surface like this, it means that every line in that surface, so think of the lines as being uh, lines that would be parallel with the direction of your page, right? Every line in that surface has to uh, lie in between this tolerance zone that consists of a perfect line that is, you know, kind of the total size of it, halfway of it is below, above where the, you know, that surface should be and halfway is below, but all of the points of that surface have to lie between those two lines to lie within that tolerance zone for that surface to be straight, okay? Um, this same control can be used in another way. This same control can be used to control how straight the axis is of a round part, for instance, right? So that's shown right here. The derived median line of the feature must be straight within a cylindrical tolerance zone of a, with a diameter of 0.05, okay? 
So that's when you want it to be called out that way, um, it, there is actually an important way that you have to place that feature control frame on your drawing. It has to be placed underneath a feature of, or a, a size feature, right? Some, a place where you have said that there's a size of something. You have to show that feature control frame underneath that size, and when you do, that indicates that you are referring to a center line or a center axis like this one is. And so this is saying that center line has to be straight within a cylindrical tolerance zone with a diameter of 0.05 millimeters. All right. And so this is kind of the two usages that, that are common for this, uh, you know, this element of being straight. Okay. Flatness. Flatness is kind of like straightness, right? But in this case, what we're doing is we are defining two planes that are parallel with each other. And those two planes, uh, again, they are sort of halfway above and halfway below where you say the plane is supposed to be, right? It's kind of where we've set these two planes. And we're saying that all of the points of that plane have to lie, or points of that surface, I really should say, have to lie between those two planes. Okay, and it gives you only a certain amount that that surface can be not flat, right? There's only a certain variation within which that surface can be not flat. Um, an important point that I need to make here is that a lot of these drawings that come out of the Shigley text um, show these surfaces kind of as imperfect. It shows them kind of like wavy, okay? They're doing that on purpose to kind of indicate that no, no surface is ever perfect. Right? Every surface is kind of imperfect. And the, the point I want to make about that is that very often for real imperfect surfaces, they are a lot of times way less wavy than the ones that are shown in the Shigley text. And they very often have other defects like just a straight curvature, let's say. Or maybe just they're sloped from one end to the other, but they're not you know, totally the direction that they're supposed to go. Right? So I did want to point that out, that they are making the point in a lot of these diagrams in Shigley by showing you a wavy surface. They're making the point that it, this surface doesn't have to be perfect. But the common defects that you probably are going to encounter very often are going to be less like wavy, and very often they're going to be more like you know, something that's just curved when it's not supposed to be, or a slope that it's not supposed to be. Okay? So did want to kind of talk through that a little bit. Okay? Um, the flatness uh, control is very often used on the primary datum feature, all right? And it's, if you flip through, um, you know, GD&T drawings and kind of look at them, you very almost always will see this, um, you know, flatness control that you will see on, you know, almost always on your primary datum feature, but then sometimes on your other datum features as well. Why do you think that might be? Any thoughts? Okay. So think about, if you go back to the presentation we had on datums, um, datums are, or datum features really is what I need to say there. Datum features are these surfaces of your part that you rely on in order to just even orient your part properly, right? And you generally have to put those surfaces up against some datum feature simulator. And that's how you end up getting the part at least close to what you feel like is oriented in a direction that you want it oriented so that you can do whatever other operation or other measurement that you're trying to do on the rest of the part. So it's, if you try to use a surface that's not flat as your primary datum feature, then it's very possible that your part might not end up actually lining up straight when you get ready to do your other operations or measurements. And that's why a lot of times you will see this flatness control on your primary datum feature on a lot of these parts, right? It makes it more possible to measure it and know whether or not you met your goal. It makes it more possible to orient your part in whatever kind of fixtures that you were trying to put it in in order to do a machining process or something. It makes it more possible for you to get it in there and, you know, actually have some chance of getting the other features the way you want them, okay? Um, Here's an interesting thing. Again, kind of like the last, the straightness control we just looked at, right? If you place the feature control frame underneath a size dimension like this, it has a similar meaning. Instead of saying that we are, we are holding uh, like one surface of this part to where it has to be flat, instead of saying that, what we're really saying 
is that we are going to try to hold the center plane of this part within some reasonable range of flatness. So that actually brings up an interesting point. What does that mean? Okay, because you don't even have a surface there, so how could it be flat? All right, and so that's where this, this phrase derived median plane comes into, comes into play, okay? What you have to do for a derived median plane is you have to imagine looking at opposing points on both sides of the part that this dimension is referencing, right? It's referencing this surface down here. It's also referencing this surface up here. And your derived median plane is basically halfway between those surfaces all the way along the length, right? And actually, since it's a plane, it's all the way along both lengths, right? And you're going halfway between those two surfaces is where this derived median plane idea comes from. And by saying that the derived median plane has to be planar within some range, it's basically saying something about actually the outer surfaces of this part, right? That's what it, the physical thing it's saying something about. But from those outer surfaces, you can derive what the median plane would be. And this control holds that derived median plane within some tolerance. OK, does that make, kind of make sense? If I was going to show you a picture of that, it looks a little bit more like this. That's what the tolerance zone would look like, is two perfect planes right, inside of this part. But we're saying that the derived median plane has to uh, all the points of that derived median plane have to lie in that sandwich of two perfect planes that are separated by the value that we put in there for our tolerance. All right, with me? Okay, so that's flatness. The next one we're going to look at is called circularity. All right, and it is very much like it might look like how circular is something. Okay, this is actually a 2D uh, type of a control. But if you apply it to a surface, what it basically means is that 2D control has to apply everywhere along the length, right? So in this case, we have this circularity control that is applied to this cylindrical part, right? And that circularity control is saying that no matter where I slice this part, the slice that I find has to have a circular profile to it within some range. Right? And that range can be defined something like this picture over here. Right? You have an inner circle and an outer circle. We're saying any slice we pick had better have a shape that uh, lies between those two circles. Okay? So that's what I mean here by the tolerance zone being a 2D annulus between two concentric circles. Right? It's like a ring. Um, okay? So that just reiterates what I just said, that every slice must satisfy that constraint. This is an interesting thing. Um, most of the uh, resources that you see on GD&T actually recommend that you don't use this control, okay? which is kind of interesting. It's in there, but they recommend you not to use it un unless you have some really good reason that you know of why not to use it. And here's why. This is actually a very difficult uh, parameter to accurately inspect, at least according to how it's technically defined. okay? Most people who want to inspect something like this, what they will do physically is they will put this part in, let's say, a chuck of a lathe, and then they will take a uh, dial indicator and put it on there, and they will see how far does the dial indicator move as you rotate it. Well, here's the thing. Technically, that's not quite right, because technically what we're supposed to do is be able to independently, independent of turning this thing or anything, we're supposed to be independently checking what that profile might look like, not dependent on how it's sitting in a lathe, right? And so this, but it's very difficult to do that, although it is possible. You know, coordinate measuring machines and such can get this kind of information if you have the, you know, sophisticated enough equipment to do it. It's just not common that most uh, shops are going to have that kind of equipment. So it's generally discouraged to use this control. And instead, there's another geometric control we're going to look here at the end called runout. Runout is directly what I was talking about in terms of using a lathe to figure out you know, just how much radial change there might be on the surface of a part as you rotate it. Okay? But it's kind of its own thing, even though it's related to this, it is you know, sort of uh, done with the idea of a lathe in mind. And so 
that's the one that is probably a better one to use that's going to be easier for people to inspect and it's going to get you a similar kind of result for the type of control that you want. All right. All right, the next one we're going to look at here is called cylindricity. All right. Um, and uh, Microsoft doesn't like the word cylindricity. It always wants to put the red squiggly line underneath it every time I type it. So, but it is a word, um, and this is one of the controls that we have to use on, uh, on cylindrical parts. Um, what you're trying to control with, with this cylindricity actually has several aspects to it. You can control circularity with it, but you're also simultaneously controlling straightness and taper. Right? And the reason why is that the cylindricity uh, geometric control sets up basically a cylinder inside of a cylinder for the tolerance zone. Right? It's the space between two cylinders is what makes up the tolerance zone. And so once you say that that's where that has to, that has to be what contains all of the surface points of this cylindrical feature, that means that you can only get so unstraight. Right? If you go too far bent, right? if the center line of this thing starts to get you know, frowny or smiley, at some point the outer surface of this part starts to violate either the inner or the outer uh, one of those cylinders and you end up not kind of meeting this, uh, this geometric control, if that makes sense. So um, it can control all three of those things. Um, the symbol for it, I didn't point this out just a second ago, but it, it's basically this circle with a couple of lines on either side of it. And this is a very interesting thing about this control. I already mentioned it's a space between two centric, concentric cylinders, but the interesting thing about this control is that the value that you have next to it, um, you'll notice it does not have the little diameter symbol in front of it. The reason for that is that the tolerance zone is not technically uh, cylindrically shaped. It's actually two cylinders, right? It's not just a cylinder, it's two cylinders. So we can't just say a diameter of, because it doesn't really make sense to do that. Instead, this one is defined in terms of a radius value, right? So the number that you put in here is actually the difference in radius between your inner and your outer cylinder, right? That, you, that set up your tolerance zone. All right, with me? So that is cylindricity. I actually decided this is one that I wanted to go just a little bit deeper on today. By the way, I, I meant to say this too. The leader can point to either view, right? So when you use this, and you, this is called a leader, the little part that has an arrow that goes over there and points. Um, I put it in orange so that you could see that an alternate way of doing it is you can point at the view that is sort of end on on your cylinder, or you can point at the view that's sort of from the side of your cylinder. And either way is acceptable according to the ASME standard. Um, here's what I was about to say. I wanted to give you an example of where cylindricity might matter. Okay? Um, there are scenarios that are out there where it doesn't necessarily matter as much what the cylindrical size is. It matters more how close it is to a cylinder. Right? And so I'm going to show you the example I thought of first when I thought of that. This is a drum break. Okay? So what you see there is that this part over here stays stationary. It has a little actuator that pushes the shoes of the drum brake into the drum itself. All right. And with a uh, setup like this, what it's made to do is it's made to slow a vehicle down usually. That's where the most of these are found is on a vehicle. And it's made to slow that vehicle down by pushing these shoes into the drum and the drum is rotating. Okay. And the shoes have roughly kind of a portion of a cylindrical shape to them. And those push into a cylindrical shape that is inside of this drum, right? So let's think about what happens if the inside of that drum is not perfectly cylindrical, right? So whoever made it tried to make it cylindrical, but it didn't turn out to be perfectly cylindrical. What are some consequences of that? OK. If it's, un if it's not cylindrical and instead of cylindrical, it has some taper to it, you might have uneven wear on one side of the shoe relative to the other side of the shoe, right? So that might be what you might be talking about. What's another thing that could be wrong if it's not cylindrical? The shoe may not be as effective not touching the area. Okay, so you might be touching less than the full amount of the shoe area, um, a contact between the thing, okay? 
what if, think about this. What if it's kind of, uh, instead of it being circular, it's a little bit more like egg-shaped? OK, might not fit. I'm talking ever so slightly egg-shaped. What's that going to do as it rotates, and you've got these two shoes pushing out into it as it rotates, and you have this slight egg shape? Okay. When it turns to the point where the big end of the egg is the direction that the shoes are pushing, what are the shoes going to do? They're going to fall into that wider area of the egg, right? Okay. Then it's going to want to keep turning, right? But it's going to have to force those shoes to come back inward in order for it to keep turning. How are you going to feel that as the car continues to roll forward? The car is going to feel like it's surging, right? It's not going to have that even braking because the, uh, the shoes themselves have to kind of come in and out in order to follow the profile of that inside of that drum, right? So it really matters here that, the, uh, that this surface be cylindrical or else you're going to get those kind of negative effects going on on your brake. OK, does it matter what the absolute diameter is as much? Probably not. OK, one of the things you see here on this diagram, it says shoe adjustment. It points at this thing over here, right? Uh, these drum brake type of things typically have something built into them that will keep pushing the shoes further and further out if they need to, right? And so. If, you're, uh, if your brake drum ends up just a little bit bigger, let's say, than it's supposed to be, no big deal. Just push your shoes out a little bit further, right? So there's really not that big a consequence to the size of it varying, but we do want to make sure that the cylindricity of it stays, you know, intact. And so kind of uh, this basically summarizes all of that that I was just saying. We need that precise cylindricity, but the absolute size isn't nearly as big a deal. OK, so here's the thing. There's a 2D drawing of a brake drum. All right. Now what our job is, we want to try to specify to somebody um, how to make this brake drum so that we don't have those problems of it not being cylindrical. OK, with our sort of traditional tolerancing methods are just straight plus minus that we have to go with. Remember, rule one. Um, does give us some manner of form control just by having rule one, just with plain old school tolerancing, right? So one possible answer could be that we could basically just do this. We could say, here's what the diameter of that inside, um, you know, surface of that drum is supposed to be. Let's just say plus or minus, you know, and then let's make it tight, right? So make this tolerance here really tight so that we don't end up with it being not cylindrical, right? So let's say we, we call it, you know, a hundredth of a millimeter. That way we're, we've really honed in and make sure that that's not uh, the wrong shape, right? It's going to have a cylindrical shape because I've made that tolerance really tight, right? That's using our traditional tolerancing techniques. What's wrong with that? That's going to be expensive to make. Why? You put tighter tolerances on it, and you put this pretty tight tolerance on a pretty big part, and it has to have that tolerance the whole way. What if the machinist you know, who's making this thing messes up just a little bit and ends up making it a little bit too big? It'll be out of tolerance, and he won't be able to deliver it saying this brake shoe or brake, excuse me, brake drum is in good shape. It, it messes up, right? This is why a better way to do this rather than this kind of traditional way of making sure that that um, maintains the shape that it's supposed to do, a better way of doing it, I don't know if you can see this, it doesn't necessarily pop, but I added this right up here. Okay. Now what does that do? What if I did that that I just put up there and did it in conjunction with a plus or minus, I don't know, two millimeters, something nice and fat that you can say, I don't care what it is as long as it's within this, you know, this range. I don't necessarily care what the absolute size is, right? 
Is that going to be cheaper to make? Yeah. You know why? Because whatever they use to turn that surface is naturally going to make a cylinder within a fairly tight tolerance, actually. Right? It's going to naturally make a cylinder. What it's not going to be as easy to do is make a cylinder that's an exact size. Right? So we gave plenty of looseness on the exact size, and we said, but the shape has to remain a cylinder. And that way we get a part where we've specified the tolerances that make sure it's workable, and yet it's still relatively inexpensive to produce. Does that make sense? So that's a, an example of using a cylindricity control uh, in order to actually make possibly the cost of a part cheaper. All right. So those, are, those were form controls that we just finished looking at. We're going to get into another little family of controls called orientation controls. Okay? And the first one we're going to look at here is called angularity. All right? um, first thing to know about these is that any of these orientation controls, they only control rotation, not translation. Okay? So whenever you apply one of these, or one of these orientation controls, it doesn't really have anything to say about positioning or translation of where this occurs. All it has to say is angularity. How, how far is it angularly away from some datum? Okay, so that's what I have right here. Orientation controls do not control location like position. They only control angular positioning, right? Angular uh, orientation. Okay, um, and may as well get in and start looking at this angularity one. Um, when you specify an angularity control, it has to reference a datum, has to you know, at least reference one datum, because you're specifying what the angle is relative to something. So you have to reference that datum that you are choosing. And in this case, we're saying that it's referencing this datum down here on the bottom. You notice here that it gives a basic angle of 30 degrees. How do I know it's basic? Okay. Anytime you see a dimension, whether it be an angle or a length, and it's in a box like this, that is an indicator to you that that is a basic dimension. Okay. So that's a basic dimension of 30 degrees. What that does is it sets up a 30 degree plane, a perfect 30 degree plane relative to datum A. Right? And it says that relative to that plane, we're setting up a tolerance zone to either side of that plane where the total amount of space between the two planes of the tolerance zone has to be the size that's listed in the, um, you know, in the feature control frame. Okay, so in this case, 0.2 millimeters total between these two, uh, between these two planes that make up the tolerance zone, right? And all of the surface points of this face have to lie between those two planes. All right. So here's another thing that's kind of interesting. Um, I, I mentioned down here, this can apply to lines or planes. So the, the example I'm giving here uh, is for a plane, meaning that we're orienting one plane relative to another plane. But would it be possible to orient, let's say, an axis relative to a plane? Probably, right? So it is possible for this to apply both to planes as well as to axes, but sometimes you have to actually include more datums in order to fully define what the trajectory is, let's say, of the line that you are trying to define using this angularity control. Like you might need to define what is the angle relative to this plane, and then what is the angle relative to that plane for a line, and that way you fully specify what that line would be in 3D. Does that make sense? So that's kind of why I put this note over here. This is a note that comes out of the ASME standard, but it says you have to include enough datums in order to constrain the required rotational degrees of freedom of the piece that you are trying to control, right? So you have to actually include enough uh, datums so that you can specify what the um, ultimate direction is of the geometry that you are trying to specify. All right. So there is angularity. Um, the next one we're going to look at is called perpendicularity. Now here's the cool thing. Perpendicularity is not different than angularity except for it refers to a specific angle, right? That angle being 90 degrees. 
Okay, so you see here, this is a perpendicularity control that is applied to the surface here. Um, and that surface is specified to be perpendicular within two planes that are 0.2 millimeters apart, right? Um, it, it's between those two planes and those two planes are perpendicular to datum A, okay? Um, one quick point that I wanna make on this is that they show in this other figure kind of physically how you can interpret what that perpendicularity control is and they show you this 90 degree angle that's in a box and makes it look like that's a, a basic uh, dimension, right? That that 90 degrees is this basic dimension. Um, an interesting point I just wanna make is that on the drawing, you don't have to include an angle if you're doing a perpendicularity control. Why not? Perpendicular is perpendicular, right? Like the, we know what that means, right? And so you don't have to say this perpendicular means 90 degrees. But they do show that on this diagram just to make it absolutely clear that you know that those two lines are 90 degrees away from the datum that was being referenced. Okay. Um, this control can be also be applied to other things besides just a plane. For instance, here it is being applied to an axis where this axis um, you know, is being controlled within a cylindrical tolerance zone that has a diameter of 0 0.05 millimeters. And what's being controlled is basically how perpendicular this hole is relative to datum A, right? Datum A would be this side of this part. So you're, what this control is trying to do is make sure that this hole that goes through this part remains perpendicular to this datum face over here, okay? And it does so by de establishing a cylindrical tolerance zone for the center axis of that hole, right? And as long as the center axis of that hole stays in this tiny little cylindrical tolerance zone, then that means that um, you, know, you have met the criteria that was set forth for this part, okay? Um, so what I'm kind of pointing out there, orientation controls can apply to feature surfaces, or it can also apply to derived center axes or planes. We talked about that derived center plane with our first example, uh, straightness example, I think, or maybe it was flatness. But anyway, um, just like that, there is a derived center axis of a hole, right? You can kind of think of, you know, taking opposing points at any location along the hole and the halfway point between those opposing points all the way down the length of the hole will establish this, you know, we'll call it an axis, but it could be something that sort of snakes around a little bit, right? Because the hole may not be perfect, right? But once you've established what that median line is for the hole, that median line has to lie within the uh, cylindrical tolerance zone for this example of the perpendicularity constraint, okay? Um, by the way, this, um, this, you know, orientation controls, I said this generally on purpose, this isn't just for the perpendicularity control, this also goes for the angularity control, even though I didn't show you an example like that, okay? You can control the center axis of a hole, let's say, using the angularity control. All right, now parallelism, okay? You probably saw that one coming. Um, parallelism controls whether or not two faces are parallel to each other, right? And it does so by establishing a tolerance zone. This is kind of what that might look like here. By the way, there wasn't a good picture of this in your text, and so I, I went out to uh, this website, gdntbasics.com. Highly recommend it. It's a very good website to um, kind of give you all the details of what each one of these controls are. So I'll just mention that right there. But um, Anyway, this surface here, it's being said, has to be parallel with datum A within a tolerance zone that is of size 0 0.03 millimeters, okay? So here's what that means. There's a space between these two planes at 0 0.03 millimeters apart, and all of the surface points of that surface that we're pointing at right there have to lie between those two planes. And those two planes are set up perfectly parallel to datum A. Okay, so that's a parallelism 
uh, control. And this is really just a special case of angularity where the angle is zero as opposed to some non-zero angle, okay? This is another one where I thought I'd give you a quick example of a place where this might come into play and make our lives better when we tolerance something. This is a vice that you might find on a, uh, like a milling machine, let's say. Okay, and that's a, a place where a vice like this might live. When you use a vice like this on a milling machine, typically what you're going to do is you're gonna take this bottom surface of the vice and install it on the bed of the milling machine. And the bed of the milling machine is sort of presumed that it's going to be pretty square relative to all the dimensions of the milling machine, right? But you stick this vise on there, and then you're going to put the parts that you're going to start milling on in the vise, right? Would you like for your parts to remain square still with all the different axes of the milling machine? Probably so, right? Matter of fact, when you do that, uh, depending on how you set your part in the vise, it very well could be that this surface down here on the vise ends up being the datum feature simulator for that part that you start to mill, right? So you want that surface right there to be very parallel to the bed of the milling machine, or else you might end up starting to mill on your parts and you, end up make a, you might end up making a surface that would not be parallel as much as you want with the opposite surface, for instance, okay? So it, for a device like this, it's very important that this surface up here be very parallel with the bottom surface in order to make sure that your parts end up right, all right? So you can see on this drawing, no tolerances have been put on yet, right? If we're gonna do a tolerance for the height of the bed, and, and I'm calling this part down here the bed, right, where the part is gonna go in there and sit, Right? If you're going to do a tolerance on the height of that relative to the bottom of the vise, how important is that, do you think? Like just the, literally it's this 46 millimeter dimension down here. How important is that one to maintain? What if it was 47? Would that throw everything off? Okay. I mean, we don't know enough necessarily about this, what it's going to be used for, I guess, to say for sure. But I'll say my intuition says that probably wouldn't matter very much if that varied a little bit, okay? So we could just go ahead and throw on there, you know, 46, and let's just put on there 46 plus or minus 1, all right? That's pretty loose. Just about anyone's going to be able to do that. It's going to make, not going to make the price of this too high, right? What's wrong with that? Okay, if this is the only tolerance I put on there, then one of the things that I have allowed by rule one is I have allowed for the surface of this uh, piece right here where we're going to be setting our parts, it is okay for it to have a one millimeter variation from one end to the other, right? As a matter of fact, it can have a one millimeter variation plus or minus, so it's actually a total of two millimeter variation, right? all over the place, all over this whole surface. But one of, the, one of the ways that that might manifest itself is that the surface of this thing might actually be sloped to where it's a millimeter high on this end and a millimeter low on that end. And if this was the only control we put on there, we couldn't say that it was made improperly. Okay, so you see the problem with that? The problem is it's not parallel enough, okay? So then you might go, okay, well, I want to I wanna fix that. So, and I want to fix that using my traditional tolerancing techniques. So why don't I tighten that up, right? I don't want it to be all that loose where it can be just any sort of size. Let's make it 46 millimeters plus or minus 15 hundredths of a millimeter, okay? That tightens it up a lot, right? All right, what's the problem with that? It might be expensive. I don't know necessarily how expensive it'll be, but you have made it to where this whole surface has to be a particular height. Again, if a machinist building this thing messes up, and let's say cuts a little bit too much material off, now the whole piece has to be scrapped, right? Whereas if what you do is just control the parallel aspect of it, right? That parallel, as the um, you know, property of it, 
then it doesn't really matter as much how tall the thing is. And so if some mistake gets made, you can just machine a little bit more material off and it makes it flat enough, makes it, um, makes it parallel enough for it to be an acceptable piece of equipment, right? So we're gonna reject this way of doing it also because it might be too expensive. And instead, what if we do it this way? Okay, we say that size dimension can be plus or minus a millimeter. That gives us plenty of flexibility for the height of that above where it sits on the bed of the, uh, of the milling machine. But we've said that that surface has to be parallel, which basically sets up uh, our tolerance zone as being two planes, right? And those two planes have to be no more than 0 0.03 millimeters apart from each other. That means they have to be pretty parallel, right? But the overall location of it doesn't have to be in a spe specific spot, right? Earlier I mentioned that these orientation controls do not control uh, location, right? So this is an example of that. That location can sort of change, but the orientation has to be um, held within that tolerance zone, okay? So what we get is it's parallel enough and it's likely to cost less, but still be functional, all right? All right, so the next one is the profile of a line, okay? Um, the symbol that we see for that is this little um, kind of humpy looking thing right here. And what we're doing here is we are saying that the shape of any line that you view from this direction that goes along this surface has to lie within this uh, space between two curves that correspond with the curve that is shown, but are spaced above and below where this curve is located. Here's what that looks like. Okay. Again, I got this from GDNT Basics, so that's a really good website to look at this kind of stuff. But you see the spacing goes above and below, but what we're looking at is just one line, right, that would be seen from the view that you look at this uh, at on the drawing, right? You see it in this view, you look at one of those lines, and we're saying that all of the points of that line have to lie between these two corresponding curves that are you know, just like the original curve, just spaced up and spaced down, okay? Um, and this one actually has two different um, datums referenced. What do you think that means? Okay, we kind of need that actually because, um, you know, the shape of this thing, it would matter if it shifted left and right. It would also matter if it shifted up and down, right? Like it would change what it was if it shifted left and right or if it shifted up and down. And so it has to reference both A and B in order to get the shape of this curve to kind of be replicated according to what it says it's supposed to be. Okay. Uh, so anyway, individual 2D curves must match the ideal curves within that tolerance zone. Um, if you're going to measure this, typically what has to be done is a coordinate measuring machine has to actually go and feel out these, li these lines that go along the surface and uh, kind of measure whether or not you, you know, your, your actual lines lie within the tolerance that you were trying to, uh, to achieve. This is a quick note, although I'm gonna do a presentation all about the different modifiers that you can put in your feature control frames. I'm mentioning here that there, one of those modifiers is called an unequally disposed modifier, and that can be used on a bunch of these uh, uh, these different kinds of controls to basically say you don't have to be equal to the top and equal to the bottom uh, for w the shape of this tolerance zone. You can say, you know, I'm going to give it more space where it's tolerable to be outside up rather than down, right? And so they, they give you a, a symbol to, that allows you to break into that. So anyway, I'll cover that more later, but I figured I'd mention it now. All right. This one's similar, but it's a little bit different because we're controlling the profile of a surface as opposed to the profile of a line, okay? What this says is that the entire surface has to lie between two surfaces that correspond with the perfect surface that is given on the drawing, right? But are spaced above and below um, where they are on the drawing, okay? And as long as all of those points stay, all the points of the actual surface stay within that tolerance zone, then you say that your part was made properly. Yes? 
On the previous slide, you have a question. Yep. Okay, so his question is, this one's nice and simple because it's, it's basically just a 2D curve that has been um, kind of extruded out like this. And so it's probably not that tough to come up with what that shape actually is. What if it was a more three-dimensional shape, right? What if it sort of had a profile to it that changed as you went along the length? And then he followed that up by saying, I guess you might have to define something like that mathematically. And the answer to that is, that's kind of what you do, right? And you have the kind of the key thing that never changes is that you have something that defines what the curve was supposed to be, right? And that can be a mathematical function, or it can be just radius values that you define properly on a 2D drawing or something like that. But you have something that defines what the curve was supposed to be. And then your tolerance zone basically takes that curve and uh, spaces it a little bit above and a little bit below wherever your actual curve that you were trying to get, right, that you said it's supposed to be. And that gives you your tolerance zone where you won't say it was bad as long as all of your points lie within that tolerance zone. Yeah. So he says, in order to make something like that, you might have to have like a CNC machine, um, you know, that would be able to take some mathematical function and actually make it happen in real life. And yeah, that's what you would have to do. As a matter of fact, a coordinate measuring machine that they mention up here, very often those are also CNC controlled, right? And so they have some sort of a technique of going about probing each and every point along the surface, or at least as many points as it needs to get a feel for kind of whether or not you have any points that are outside of what they're supposed to be. Um, that can also be a CNC type piece of equipment that would have to do that type of job. All right, so back to the idea of controlling the profile of a surface. Um, you know, same idea, but this time we have two surfaces and all of the points of the surface we're trying to control have to lie between those two surfaces for the tolerance zone, okay? Um, this was uh, what I was about to say anyway, was um, that we can define these surfaces in terms of mathematical functions. All you got to do is make sure that on the drawing, you establish where the origin is so that that mathematical function has meaning, right? Kind of establish the origin, establish your axes, that kind of thing, so that you actually have a meaning of what that curve really means, right? So that's a, an acceptable way to establish what the shapes are both of, actually both of lines as well as of 2D surfaces like I'm showing on this picture, okay? Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, if you, you probably don't remember this perfectly because there's a lot of information in that table, but in the table we looked at at the beginning, you'll notice that it said for these profile uh, controls that datum referencing was optional. Isn't that interesting, okay? Basically what that says is, you don't have to reference a datum if you don't want to, but what that means is that when you go to inspect the surface, right, that surface can float anywhere that, if you haven't referenced any datums, there's no reason that surface can't float somewhere else, and the person who's inspecting it has to determine whether the surface was right independent of where it has floated to, right? Does that sound harder? That's definitely harder, right? And so they typically discourage you from, a, from specifying these floating surfaces. So in, in, to avoid specifying a floating uh, profile like this, what you do is you reference datums. And that basically nails down where that surface is supposed to be and exactly where the tolerance zones are supposed to be. And that way you know where all the surface points are supposed to be. Okay, or the range in which they're supposed to be. All right, um, another point that we'll make here real quick is that um, if you're not careful and you end up with a, uh, let's say a shady machinist of some kind, right, and you hand them a drawing and your, your part comes back, let's say with a giant divot in one side, right? And you go, what's up with that, man? You left a giant divot, like you made a big hole in one side of my part. 
you know, but it's not very defined. It's just sort of this big indentation. And you look at it and you go, that wasn't what I specified. What's the problem? Okay, unless you have a note something like this down at the bottom of your drawing that says, hey, unless I say something else, all of the profiles, all of the surfaces of this part can't be any more than this amount away from what I said they were supposed to be, right? If you don't put something like that on there, then let's say a big dent shows up in a part like this and it comes back to you and, and the machinist goes, well, you didn't tell me I couldn't do that. You didn't tell me that would be a fault if there was a big, you know, gouge out of the side of it, right? But if you put this down there, it basically says, hey, don't go any further. If, if you have a question about any surface on this thing, don't ever go any further than 0.3 millimeters away from what I said it needed to be because, you know, I don't even know what you might end up trying to do on this part, but I want to make sure you don't go too crazy on any of the surfaces, right? So this is sort of a catch-all way to say, try to make it pretty close to what I specified. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, and you'll see that on a good number of drawings where they have some overall note put at the bottom of the drawing that says, unless otherwise specified, here is the overall profile control, and that keeps a machinist or, you know, whoever else is going to be manufacturing a part from doing something like that and, and trying to put it back on you that's, you know, you didn't say I couldn't do that. Okay. All right. Here's another couple of uh, kind of particulars with respect to specifying profiles. Um, there are some specific ways that you can actually call out multiple surfaces. Okay. Um, kind of the default is not multiple surfaces, right? It points, the leader points at a particular surface on this part. And so the interpretation of that is that that profile control really only applies to that one surface that's being called out. Okay, so that's kind of condition A right there. There's another cool thing in that you can specify sort of a start point and an end point, and when you point at a surface between that start point and that end point, it says that whole surface should all be included in that note, right? So by labeling that point G and labeling that point H and saying between G and H, I want this profile control, it basically says that that tolerance zone extends up and over and down. Okay, that's kind of cool, right? That'd be handy in certain cases. All right, there's another pretty cool symbol that, you know, may be a throwback to some things you might remember when we're talking about welding. This one is the all around symbol, right? You put that right there on the little jog in the leader. What that says is that whole chain of little line elements right there apply this profile to that whole thing. So in 3D, what that would look like is literally like it's wrapped all the way around this part and that you're going to have that, pro that profile control that you specified there exist all the way around that perimeter. Okay. Two circles means everywhere, right? Put it on the whole dang thing, right? I'm being a little bit facetious, but it basically says not only should you go all the way around the whole thing, you should also do the end enclosures as well, and that that profile control is applied to all of that. Okay, so that is uh, those are some of the ways that you can call out multiple surfaces with one uh, little annotation on your drawing. Um, this is an interesting one too, in that this also applies for line profiles. Okay. You'll notice here that I put this little example on here. It calls out this line profile going from point X to point Y, right? There's point X right there and down to point Y. But it's calling this out for a line profile. And, um, you know, it's the same meaning, right? It says go from here to there, right? Go from X to Y and that whole surface along the interior there is covered by that one note. Okay. All right. We've already looked at this one, but I figured I'd bring it up again since it's in the table. Um, we're shifting now from uh, those profile controls now to location controls, and this one is called the position control. So this is, uh, you know, most likely the most used control in GD&T. So this is a good one to know about. And um, 
what you have with a location control is that the tolerance zone is called out with basic dimensions. In this case, we're, we're uh, specifying the location of a hole. We're specifying the location of that hole using a basic dimension of six, uh, you know, presumption here because we have that zero out in front that this is in millimeters. So six millimeters up from the bottom down here, up from, uh, you know, our uh, C uh, datum down here and two millimeters over from our B datum, right? Um, so that's this, uh, this surface right here is that B datum. Um, anyway, that specifies where that axis is going to be, and that axis, off of that axis, we make a cylindrical tolerance zone, and then any actual axis of the hole that we actually drill, that's this black axis that goes down through here, has to be contained in that tolerance zone cylinder. That makes sense? So that's how the location control works. Um, and so, you know, again, the uh, axis of the tolerance zone is exactly located and the shape of the tolerance zone is exactly specified, but then that gives you the range through which the axis of the hole can actually acceptably vary. Um, there's just a close up of it right here. Um, interesting thing that I'll, I'll call out here as well is that when you use a position control like this and you put it underneath a size dimension, the size uh, dimensions aren't actually part of the position control, right? The position control is kind of its own thing. All right. So again, we already went over the location control, so I won't necessarily belabor that one too much more. There are two other location controls called concentricity and symmetry, okay? With concentricity, what you're doing is you're saying that the center axis of a feature of revolution has to be congruent within a cylindrical tolerance zone with a datum axis. This actually turns out that this is not that different than calling out a straightness control. All right, this is actually not very different than just a plain straightness control applied to a surface where the surface implies a median axis that goes through the middle of it, okay? Um, this is also, in order to actually do this exactly like it's defined, it's extremely hard to do, right? The equipment to do a, an inspection along these lines is very difficult to actually perform. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, actually for quite a while now, it has been uh, recommended that you, you know, use this sparingly, if at all, right, this concentricity uh, control. Symmetry is kind of similar to it, only instead of it being kind of a, a feature of revolution, symmetry has to do more with sort of prismatic features, right? But what it says is if you call out two different uh, surfaces, then the, you know, like two different surfaces that define sort of a datum, then the actual uh, middle of that has to lie within some tolerance zone, right, that is symmetric across the two sides of where the datum is called out, okay? Again, this one is hard to inspect, right? So it is typically recommended that you not use this one if you can avoid it, all right? As a matter of fact, uh, it persisted that way for so long that even though we're studying the 2009 version of the ASME standard, I'll tell you that the 2018 version of the ASME standard removed these two controls from that standard. So those are no longer, if you're using ASME uh, Y14.5-2018, it is no longer acceptable for you to use these controls under that standard. All right. The reason why is that there are better ways to get those kind of controls than these. And so it kind of lasted for a while where they recommended you not use them. And now they don't even exist in the new standard. But in case you see these symbols, right? Um, and actually, I, I meant to put the symbols up here, but I, uh, I must have neglected to do it. But the, the two symbols um, for these two parts, one of them is kind of like two different circles, like one inside of the other something like this, right? And then the other one, I believe, has like a line with another line and another line below that. Um, if you see those kind of symbols, you'll at least know what they are, 
right? And um, you'll know not to use them whenever you're setting up your drawings. All right, we talked about this earlier, but these are our runout controls, okay? And there's two different versions of them. The first one that it's, it's shown with a single arrow here, okay? That single arrow right there means that this is circular runout that we're specifying right there. What that says is that if we were going to put a dial indicator anywhere on this surface right here and set it up to where, you know, it's set up like this dial indicator is shown right here, and then we take this part and rotate it in, let's say, the jaws of a, a lathe, like the jaws of a chuck of a lathe, right? We start rotating it in there and watch what happens with the needle we'll be able to tell how much radial difference there is as we rotate it on the surface of that part. The circular runout idea says you do that in a circle here, and then you know it says must not move more than 0.1 units when placed at any location along this feature. So in other words, you might have to do that at several locations along this feature if you're inspecting it, right? You might have to do that at several locations along the length of this feature to ensure that at no location along the length will it vary more than 0 0.01 millimeters, in this case, um, outside of what it was supposed to be. Okay, and that is going to be a radial value, right? So no more variation than 0 0.01, in this case, uh, amount of radius away from what it was supposed to be. All right, how does that differ with total runout? Okay, by the way, I, I put that up here, circular runout. How does that vary uh, relative to our total runout? Okay, what this says is that, let's say you set up your dial indicator in one setup. It's not like in, you know, these discrete circles that you try it at one circle, then you try it at another circle, and each time you set up your indicator at another location and try it at another location, you know. Instead of it being like that, you set up your dial indicator so that maybe it's on one of the axes of your lathe, like on the, maybe the, uh, uh, the trolley of your lathe as, as it moves back and forth so that you can move that thing any location, set it up in one setup, and you move it all the way down the length and as it rotates, and no matter where you move it, you should not see that indicator move more than whatever the specified amount is, okay? Um, and so, you know, that's what that is defined to be, that total runout. Um, some of the things that you can get out of total runout, that will control how tapered that part can be, right? If there's a total amount of runout that you can have over the whole entire length, you could only get so much taper without violating that meter going outside of whatever that uh, range would have been, right? And there's other things too, right? You, you can only get so much curvature, right? And um, so this is a, it can be sometimes handy if what you're trying to specify is not only how circular each section is, but also how cylindrical the whole length of it is. All right, um, and the note I put over here, this is definitely better than, than concentricity or circularity from the standpoint of inspection. I will even go for so far as to say it's probably also better than our cylindricity uh, criteria that we used earlier, definitely better than our circular criteria we used earlier. You're gonna actually find that you'll probably use this uh, control a pretty good bit if you start using GD and T stuff. Yes? Is that a good way to apply this to, like, to a hole? To a hole, like basically apply the idea of run out to the inside of a hole. Um, there's no reason you can't do it for a hole, right? Because there's no reason that you couldn't set up a lathe or something like that to spin it so that that hole was actually, you know, being revolved. And there's no reason, hypothetically, you couldn't get a probe to get inside of the hole and do the same idea inside of a hole, right? Um, it might have some practical challenges to it that are, you know, additional to what you would have for an external feature, but there's not a reason that it couldn't be done. Yeah. All right. So those are the controls that I wanted to present. And here's the cool thing. You know, those are all the possibilities. Those are the things that we're gonna see on a drawing, right? And so 
we might get into a little bit deeper about how to use each one or why you might want to use each one, and that's kind of what we're going to do moving forward. But now you've at least seen all of them and what they mean, and uh, now we get to sort of talk in terms of how to do you know, drawings better with them, or what does a drawing mean, or what is a drawing trying to get at with what the, the uh, call-outs are on that drawing. And so we'll be able to talk about those things a little bit more in some of our other meetings. So, sound good? All right. Um, I will uh, see you guys at the next meeting.